Welcome to our third Facebook Live presentation of the series, Seven Strategies for Thriving with Heart Failure. Today, we'll be answering questions focused on living your best life after a heart failure diagnosis. Thank you for joining us for this live broadcast from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm your host and moderator, Dr. Sharon Hayes, cardiologist and founder of the Women's Heart Clinic here at Mayo and a member of Women Heart's Scientific Advisory Council. Today, our panel includes preventive cardiologist and Mayo colleague, Dr. LaPrincess Brewer, heart failure nurse practitioner and member of the American Association of Heart Failure Nurses, Ms. Tasha Freitag, and heart failure thriver and women heart champion, Brandi Taylor. Please start submitting your questions now and we'll answer them throughout our discussion. As questions come in from our audience, I'd like to highlight that this is a three-part series that has been aimed at shining a light not only on heart disease in women, but also the challenges that women face in the diagnosis, the treatment, and the living with heart failure. As with other types of heart disease, women have different risk factors for heart failure compared to men, with high blood pressure being a critical factor. Women's heart failure is different in other ways. They more often than men develop heart failure with normal or near normal heart pumping function. This is called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF. This is important because this difference has meant that women have not been included in heart failure research and there is not a single proven medical treatment or drug for HEFPEF. And women living with heart failure are different in other ways. They are more often caregivers to others, which impacts their own self care and well being. Women more often experience depression and anxiety, which deeply impacts their quality of life. That's why in this session, we want to highlight not only the importance of clinical care that is so important to living with heart failure, but also those psychosocial factors that are important for women's ability, not only to survive the diagnosis, but to thrive with heart failure and heart disease. Let's start our first question, and we can begin with Dr. Brewer. What are some of the potential emotional and social impacts of a heart failure diagnosis? Yeah, so heart failure, um, we must recognize, can be a debilitating disease and can affect one's quality of life. One of the major risk factors for, risk factors, sorry, for poorer outcomes in heart failure is depression. And it's estimated that approximately one in five patients living with heart failure um, have depression. And women are more likely to develop depression. And this is very important as this influences how they interact with the healthcare system. This can lead to worsening of symptoms, which then can lead to more hospitalizations. And this also affects their ability to survive and thrive with heart failure. And also we must realize that uh, heart failure affects more than just the patient's heart. It also affects um, how they live. So it can affect their attitude and mood. It can affect their certainty about their life. Also their confidence in their um, role at work and at home. And it can also lead to self-doubt um, in themselves and their physical limitations from heart failure. So it's definitely an important consideration. So Tasha, as a heart failure nurse, this is your main practice. What, what else have you seen? As Dr. Brewer said, I think, you know, it's it's so scary, a diagnosis of heart failure. There's so much uncertainty when people are told they have, you know, just even the terminology of heart failure mm -hmm. is really scary. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a ton of uncertainty about what's next in our future. Um, am I going to be able to do the things that I do at home, at work, for my family? Is my role going to change? Am, am I going to change? You know, there's so much change in who we are and so much uncertainty that that can be quite scary. And I think as in the field, we're starting to understand that it's more than just an emotional response. It's also a biologic response that that heart failure and depression kind of come together sometimes as a package deal and that we need to do a better job of addressing both to help our patients do better, to, to help our patients thrive from both both a emotional and a health perspective. And I'm, I'm sure Brandy can relate to some of the toll that, that takes a new diagnosis. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. Everything that you had just described, I actually went through when I was diagnosed with heart failure. And being a mom and you knowing that you have to tear, take care of your children, uh, I have one child, um, it, does, it does affect your life, definitely. So um, 
Here's a question on community sport, which I think is perfect for you, um, Brandy. As a heart failure patient, how are you able to leverage your community and other non-medical resources to help you survive and thrive with heart failure? Well, I'm a member of the Epi Nation of San Isabel. It's a tribe that's located in Southern California. And um, as a community there, we always um, help each other out when any kind of event, uh, bad event happens. Um, and so I was able to really rely on my tribal community to come together and, and support me and my heart failure. And then eventually I had a heart transplant and they were able to come together for that. But I know in other communities, I'm sure that women can reach out to church groups, um, clubs, and also um, a big part of, of my community is Women Heart. And I was actually brought to Women Heart by another uh, Native woman. And um, I've been able to get a lot of support that way and meet a lot of women that have been through what I've been through. That's great, thank you so much. So I am, um, here's a question um, from Molly. Um, since my heart failure diagnosis, I feel like I'm on an emotional roller coaster. What should I do to feel more confident and more control? I'm gonna start with you, Tasha, um, about this. Sure. Um, a di- you see people right at the beginning yeah, of the diagnosis, Yeah, and it's a right? really scary time. You know, a diagnosis of heart failure, again, just the, the title heart failure is alarming and scary, and you don't know what's next. And on top of that, um, we ask a lot of patients when they're first diagnosed, we ask patients to change their diet. We ask them to come to appointments day after day, frequent appointments. We ask them, we add medications. Almost every two weeks, we tinker with their medications. Um, so just when patients start to feel like they get a handle on things, we change something. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can feel like an absolute roller it coaster. It is a roller coaster. <laughs> um, so that said, I think, you know, you're also, when you leave the hospital or when you're first diagnosed, you also get a lot of resources thrown at you. And sometimes it's buried in a pile of paperwork and it's buried in a bunch of people who can introduce themselves to you and it can be overwhelming. But if you can find a way to organize all of those resources and definitely take any and all resources that are given to you, in particular, um, enroll yourself or ask to be enrolled in a heart failure disease management program. We know that patients or people with heart failure who are engaged in a heart failure program do better both emotionally and with heart failure. So for those who might not know what a heart failure, or has never been offered in her, who are um, living with heart failure, what is, can you tell us what a heart failure disease management program looks like? Sure, um, heart failure disease management programs come in different shapes and sizes. Uh, most often they're championed by nurses. Um, nurses like myself who are a little bit nerdy when it comes to heart failure and we kind of obsess about it. Um, we get excited to hear what patients weigh in the morning and how much salt <laughs> had they ate yesterday. And um, we are, uh, day in and day out, we should be there to help patients who are newly diagnosed all the way through the course of the illness to help them manage adjustments in medications, adjustments, uh, getting used to the the illness itself, um, and help patients thrive. Another resource that patients should really um, consider is cardiac rehab. After a diagnosis of heart failure, um, particularly for patients who have a a weakened heart or a reduced ejection fraction, they may be may be eligible to enroll in cardiac rehab, and we know that cardiac rehab helps patients both emotionally and physically with heart failure. Um, It helps keep them out of the hospital and keeps them alive longer. I think for heart failure, particularly because one, you have to get out and go, and there's somebody there that can reassure you about Mm -hmm. about things. I know know that um, just being able to do that. So um, next question that we have, um, okay, women are not small men, okay? What should women with heart failure be aware of that may be different from men to support their surviving and thriving? I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Brewer. Um, So, you know, I would definitely say that, you know, we really enjoy um, social support and being amongst each other um, that helps us to thrive. So I must say that we must support each other so that we can become motivated um, to manage our heart failure. And that's how we're special. I think once we have that social support as women, um, we then can manage our heart failure better. Yeah, Yeah, I would add to that. I think, you know, um, 
when it comes to heart attacks, we know that men usually come to us with kind of the classic chest pain symptoms. And we know that women usually present with slightly different symptoms. We don't have the equivalent in heart failure. At least we don't know of that yet. But I would argue that um, my heart failure patients that are women tend to come to me and they don't have any complaints. They come to me and, and I ask my kind of typical standard heart failure questions. Do you feel short of breath? Do you feel fatigued? And they're like, no, no, no. And I kind of go through the script, and but I can look at them and see that something's not right. So I would say that as a woman, um, we tend to be accommodators. Uh, women tend to adjust to get the job done. Um, and that's not a, a dismissal of men as a, a gender, <laughs> per se. But um, as an example, I had a patient who came in, and I, for, I saw her for weeks, and I kept, couldn't put my finger on it, but something wasn't right, and kept asking her the standard questions, and she kept saying, nope, not short of breath, not fatigue, not, nope, nope. So finally, I asked the right question one day and said, tell me about getting groceries. Are you able yeah, to a carry? practical, yeah. yeah, practical. Yeah, and she said, you know, I'm, I can bring the groceries in. So I thought, oh, dead, that didn't, that didn't do it. But then she said, I just have to make more trips. Mm -hmm. And I said, how many more trips? And she said, well, now I have to carry a can in at a time. Mm -hmm. And originally she could carry two bags in at a time, but now she carries one thing in at a time because otherwise she's completely fatigued and can't do it. Um, so I think as women, we are not little men and we might have different symptoms, but we also might adjust differently. So be persistent. Well, I think uh, just getting a question from uh, our Facebook Live audience, uh, from Maggie, managing fatigue is one of the hardest things to overcome. And I think that that is almost a universal um, symptom at some point for people with, um, do you have some tips on how you manage fatigue? Um, what, what do you do that helps you thrive so you can do the things you wanna do? Well, I definitely rest when I need to. Uh, when your body tells you that you're tired, I actually take that and do take time for myself and to lay down. But um, what you just said about you know the fatigue, just basic functions of just going to the grocery store, taking a shower, of being that tired, but you do absolutely have to take um, time for yourself and, uh, and rest. So here's another question. So um, as a caregiver of a woman with heart failure, so spouse, children, friends, um, how can I be most supportive of her in ongoing care and well-being? I'm gonna start with you again, Brandy, because you probably have the most perspective of what was helpful and maybe what was not so helpful. Uh, well, definitely, I, I call upon my family to help, and I'm blessed that way that I have family around me all the time. Um, but <clears throat> there's also what you said, the whole psychological thing, too, is that when you're a mom, you're supposed to be strong, and you're supposed to put you know, your children first, and that's what we've always been taught. But there are times when you, know, you are tired, and um, you start to doubt yourself a little bit, like what um, you guys have said. And I think that just being able to ask for help is is a big deal you know just ask for help it's okay that's a hard one though for women isn't yes it, it is, it is yes. right if you were the one who was in charge mm -hmm. um, for all of that what are the things steve you coach people about to the caregivers because you're both going to be seeing people who are yeah. seeing your patients so you know i um you know it's natural when you're first diagnosed with heart failure to withdraw um, but I, I really encourage uh, those recently diagnosed with heart failure not to isolate themselves um, and to truly um, try to um, uh, re-engage and socialize with others, whether this be with uh, social groups such as with Women Heart or participating in cardiac rehab, which can serve as a social support group. And even if you need more specialized care with a psychologist or a psychiatrist, that is totally fine. But studies have shown that those who re-engage and socialize more have improved outcomes with heart failure and um, they uh, also are able to manage their heart failure better. So I would say definitely socialize and engage. Yes. Thanks. And I would add uh, on, on kind of two elements. So first being on the medical front, I would say if you're a caregiver, you know, um, helping your loved one get to their medical appointments or helping them schedule medical appointments, maybe signing up as a proxy into their electronic health record so that you can help them manage their appointments, their results, their correspondence. Um, of course, giving them the space to be autonomous and make their own decisions. Um, you know, picking up their prescriptions for them or help setting up their pill box. 
um, doing grocery shopping or, you know, at least supporting them in their dietary changes and maybe diving in on those dietary changes too. Yeah, which are probably healthy for everybody in the right. family and all the caregivers, right? right. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think some of the things that you mentioned, Tasha, are really about um, decreasing the work of being a patient. Mm -hmm. Um, heart failure is one of those um, conditions, as many conditions, particularly chronic conditions, where there is work associated being with the patient. And so many of the things that you all suggested uh, were really sound little, but one less trip to the pharmacy, uh, right, mm -hmm. is can mean you have time to hold your baby, right? Yes. It, it's, mm -hmm. it is one of those things. So I think thinking about those little things and not taking for granted. Mm -hmm. But what I sometimes hear from particularly women, um, and they can't do everything that they wanted to do before, but they want to be, there may be some things they, really, they love to cook, they love, they want time with their children, and people start taking those things away from them too. Like, mm -hmm. just sit and we'll watch yes. out. So I think there is a balance, right? There that is. You don't, they don't, they're still yeah. people, they're grown ups, they're adults, yep. um, right? Uh, have you had anybody yes. who tried to tell you just just we'll take care of everything or don't do something or yes. over care? Yes, well definitely. Um, with uh, my tribe, actually my son is one of our traditional singers and dancers, and I dance as well. And um, my family's like, maybe you should stop dancing for a while, but that's what kept me grounded. My culture kept me strong, and I'm like, no, I still want to dance. And our dancing isn't very strenuous, but um, it is exercise. And so, um, yeah, after many discussions, they said, go ahead and do it, because it kept it me in a good joy. place. Yeah, right. yeah. It kept me in a very good place. So. And I'm sure there are many things like unloading the dishwasher, or yeah. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. they, they can do be that. Happy to <laughs> surrender. <laughs> laundry, do yeah, the laundry. Exactly. Oh my goodness, yes, do well, the laundry. I think that any illness um, can be can almost any illness. There are losses, even if the loss is my sense of being healthy, right? Mm -hmm. And so whatever you can retain that is mm -hmm. uh, that brings you joy or like dancing yes. or caring for your children or going to work. I mean, for some people they say, well, it's time. But I think helping find the balance and asking the patient, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I have another question. Oh, well, this is a good one. Um, well, it's not a good, but it, it's a common one. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start uh, with, with you, Dr. Brewer, but um, if someone, well, I'm going to start with the patient again because you, you are the expert here. So this may have happened to you. So if somebody is struggling from recommendations from a cardiologist regarding their heart failure treatment, what should they do to take more control? Oh, definitely they, women need to advocate for themselves. Definitely. I know I was misdiagnosed with heart failure and uh, went to, you know, two different hospitals and I knew something was wrong and the doctor, you know, dismissed me. But definitely you need to advocate for yourself if you, if you know you know your body you know something's wrong you know you're not feeling good you know go to another doctor then so um and i think this is a corollary as well is sometimes you know doctors are far away yes. you know you have to travel i know to to see your healthcare providers um and you go and they make one of the 40 recommendations that tasha does <laughs> and maybe one of them doesn't work out or you think maybe it doesn't work out um how um, it's really common to just say, I'm going to stop that. I'll wait till my next appointment in three months. Um, have you had experience with that, with something didn't work out? And how would you deal with How did you deal with it then? And how might you deal with it now? Oh, well, at that time, because of just being scared and not being able to breathe and, and being very weak, and I was pregnant at the time too, that I did reach out more. Um, I know just, um, you know, being a pregnant woman, there's a lot of. Um, expectations on us and um, definitely to be strong and you know women do this all the time but when you're a young woman that's pregnant and you don't feel right you know you start to question yourself but um, yeah definitely because I was feeling so bad that's why I went to a second hospital yeah yeah, yeah. so dr. you dr. Brewer you've done a lot of work with communities that focus on culturally tailored care um, can you speak a little more about why it might be important to have care that actually is individualized to both communities or individuals? Yeah, so I must say, you know, if you're having any, you know, challenges with your care from a heart failure standpoint, definitely communicate that with your provider. It is our responsibility as healthcare providers to meet you where you are so that we can best tailor our care to meet your unique living circumstances, whatever they are. And culturally tailored care is extremely important and has been shown to improve outcomes and, and health disparities. 
So if we do not meet patients where we are, we're going in a circle. Um, and also culturally tailored care allows us to um, tailor your heart failure um, medications, um, issue referrals to resources that would benefit you. Um, so culturally tailored care is extremely important. And some of the work that we do in the community um, regarding culturally um, tailoring of interventions um, is primarily with the African American faith community. And we've not only improved health outcomes per se from a risk factor standpoint, but we've also improved their um, social support. Um, they feel like they're um, able and more confident to um, integrate healthy behavioral change, and they also feel as if they have more support from their family and friends. So it really shows the power of um, tapping into social networks while also integrating um, culturally tailored care. Can you give me an example of um, some culturally tailored care for the African American faith communities? What, what, what might somebody who's not a part of that community be surprised or, or just learn that might not be the regular healthcare provider or another community? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that the value of um, social networking. Um, they are very close knit. Um, and it's really important that you value their environment and um, also that um, you know, it, it's not just the, the individual sitting in front of you, but they're also taking care of their, their families, their, their kids, their cousins. So they, they take whatever you're telling them in the healthcare setting and um, distributing that out to their communities. So it's really important that we develop, um, you know, that personalized um, uh, conversation with folks to really know what their social determinants of health are. Yeah. Tasha, do you have anything to add? Um, I think, you know, uh, tailoring medications to the individual is a key role of the heart failure program. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier, those early on after diagnosis, we have frequent appointments and we're adjusting medications almost every visit. Um, and part of that is that tailoring of the regimen because we want to, we, we call it tinkering and it's not like we're tinkering <laughs> like you're a guinea pig, but it's it's getting you to the right dose to get you the maximum benefit without any side effects or as minimal side effects as possible. So I think, um, you know, counting on your team and relaying what you're feeling and being persistent is, is key. So here's a comment in response to that last question from one of our, our viewers that says, please don't stop your medication. Talk to, you know, it's really important that you talk with your healthcare team. So we've got people weighing in online who are really affirming affirming this. I think with the culturally based program that she just talked about, um, it's very similar with, with the tribal nations as well too. And I think maybe with the Latino families and maybe Asian families, um, that there's also three generations that live in the home most of the time. Mm -hmm. So you are taking care of not only your mother, maybe sometimes your grandma is still mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. too. So, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on that. And then another thing I'd like to add, you know, when, it, when you're you know, speaking of uh, depression and emotional support in these populations, uh, they may not feel comfortable bringing up um, that they're having any depressive symptoms. So that's a way that you have to tailor your care. Um, and this is uh, in special populations, not only women, but also racial, ethnic uh, minority groups. Yeah, you're right, because um, we haven't really addressed this, but particularly depression and anxiety and other behavioral health or mental health illnesses, um, there's a lot of stigma involved. Mm -hmm, yes. And it's, it, I mean, the stigma involved in every culture mm -hmm, and yeah. community, but it is more prominent in some than mm -hmm. others, where the mm -hmm. belief system is you should just be stronger, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Did, did that, does that resonate mm -hmm. with you? Oh, or? yes, definitely, yeah. And um, I'm actually an elected tribal leader too, so, and I've, I've definitely dealt with depression with my diagnosis and with my heart transplant. Um, but I've been trying to reach out to my community saying it's okay to ask for help, mm -hmm. and that's what I keep re restating to them that, you know, I've been through this and I'm asking for help, you can ask for help too. Yeah. Yeah. How, do, how do you counsel patients um, uh, to help them or even help caregivers accept that they need help. Because I, I think sometimes that's the case is, I have a patient who's asking for help in this regard, and I, and their family member may be saying, oh, you'll be fine, you just need to get more sleep. And I, and I think that um, helping the whole community understand how thriving means having your mm -hmm. whole, not just your heart, right? I think, just your heart. you know, um, <laughs> 
I grew up in a very rural farming area where you just buck up and deal with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, for me, I think what resonates for me and and what I often end up communicating to patients is what we said earlier is that we're starting to recognize that there is some chemistry behind this, that that this isn't a weakness of character Mm -hmm. or that somebody just can't get 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 their wits about them this is um actually there's something going on there's some relationship between heart failure and um, depression or mood whatever you want to call it and and even if there wasn't chemistry you're not at fault here i mean this is this is a big deal um this is and it doesn't hurt to help this so one thing that I sometimes talk to patients about is I emphasize how I firmly believe, and I mean, it's a, it's my own belief about the importance of the mind-heart um, connection. And those who are not quite ready to accept that maybe anxiety or depression is feeding into their symptoms, um, to talk about how I, I think, yes, you have heart disease, but your heart disease won't get better until we address this as well. And sometimes that conversation where it's all part of one can be helpful. Um, I think particularly for women, and I know this happened with you um, in your diagnosis or misdiagnosis, is they may have been told that their heart failure symptoms were anxiety, right? And so they've had an interaction with a healthcare provider that has dismissed them because, and so, for me, it's it's a delicate thing for mm-hmm. the three of us to talk to a patient and suggest that some of their symptoms might be due to anxiety or depression, mm-hmm. because they can hear, you think this is all in my head, mm-hmm. yes. and so we it, it is walking a tightrope. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to tell about your experience? I, I just it hits me in the head that when you had that doctor tell you, well, you're eight months pregnant and this is just how you're supposed to feel. Yeah, and deal with it. <laughs> uh, well, the the Thursday. That, before this all happened, um, I went into um, our Indian health clinic and they thought maybe it was asthma and um, wanted to prescribe me an inhaler and sleeping pills. And I'm like, no, it's, it's worse than that. And then the Friday when I went to the hospital, uh, actually an emergency, and our hospitals are an hour to two hours away. The closest one is an hour, so my mom took me there. And the doctor said, oh, well, you, you know, you're eight months pregnant. My wife is eight months pregnant too. She's tired, just deal with it. And they literally had to wheelchair me out. And I'm like, this is not, this cannot be normal. Yeah. Yeah. No. And so for somebody who has had that experience, having a, a healthcare provider introduce something that may not be directly due to your heart failure is probably a, a little bit harder message for some women to yes. accept, right? Because you've been betrayed before. Yes. So um, the next question that we have is, um, oh, what they, they like what we're talking about. What are some resources I can look into that cover some of the things that you've um, mentioned today? I'll start with you, Tasha. There's a couple of great resources. Um, uh, American Association of Heart Failure Nurses has a website um, that has some great uh, just one-page educational documents. Mm-hmm. Um, and then together in heartfailure.com, I would recommend, and that's a great resource if you want to connect with other heart failure patients or other heart failure caregivers. Um, you can get on there, connect. Um, also, just this organization, just being right here. Yep. Yep. You want to give a plug for some of the, the things that you have found helpful as a, as a patient? Uh, definitely Women Heart. And also, there's also links for um, Indian Health Service that has um, heart failure, because I know with, even though our population is very small, it's only 1% of the United States population, uh, we do have the highest risk of heart disease. And then there's a number of Mayo Clinic um, resources, mayoclinic.com. People can uh, get those links as they'd like to. Um, From Maggie, what should women be tracking and reporting on during their appointment? What do you want us to be telling you during our appointment? Symptoms, lifestyle, heart failure nurse who does this every day. I'm going to ask you, Tasha, to start. Well, we tend to obsess over daily weights. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the, the data on what the daily weight tells us is pretty poor, um, but it's really the only objective number that we can get over the phone. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Um, there's a lot of causes for shortness of breath and swelling, so the, the weight gives us one number that we can mm-hmm. sort of latch on to. Um, but with that, we're interested in hearing if you're more or less short of breath than you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. 
if when you're sleeping, if you had to sleep, um, if you were able to lie flat or if you had to sit up more than you did the night before or even more if you had to sit up and catch your, catch your breath at the side of the bed. Um, certainly any swelling, any bloating. Women often also complain less of swelling in their ankles but more of like, oh, my pants are just too tight around the yeah. waist and I can't explain it. Um, and then the fatigue, you know, like we were commenting earlier, you might not feel short of breath because you're not racing up the steps, but you might have just slowed down to not get to that point and you're just a little more run down and can't put your finger on what's causing it. So keeping track of those, I encourage people to journal all of those symptoms um, and then questions. Because qu- you always come to appointments and be like, oh, what was that question I was going to ask? Write it down. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> do you bring a list? Do you have a book? How do you manage the complexity of... I've, I've had to do that, write questions down too. Um, and my, I have a ton of medications, so constantly I have to bring in my list. And sometimes I'll even bring in my, um, my bottles. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You brought them today. Yeah, I did, you? actually. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this these are my this is my medication of being on a heart transplant, but I do have an apple and an orange in there. So. Okay, so you've got a healthy snack along with yeah. the many other things that you will be taking today. Yeah, um, I, I, a lot of people have misconception of heart transplant that it's actually um, a cure for a heart failure. When actually, you know, we have to continue to go to doctors. We have to have biopsies constantly. Um, we have to have. Uh, Uh, angiograms um, you know it's still constant upkeep with a lot of medication that I'll have to take the rest of my life Um, you know I mean suppression drugs and anti-rejection drugs so it's the work of being a patient yes Mm -hmm. is still very much present for you definitely that you're thriving yes Yes, (laughs) so here's a question from uh, Thea this um, how do you communicate that you would like a second opinion and would you get that opinion within the same practice so I, I, I would start with it depends on the second part of that, but why don't uh, I, you know, how, how, how do you counsel patients um, or would you counsel a friend to get maybe a second opinion about their heart failure symptoms? You know, I would, I would first of all ask, you know, how is the, the communication with you and your provider? Um, and as Brandy so eloquently uh, showed us, it's all about um, having self-empowerment and showing what you want. So it may be that there just may be a lack of communication um, that can be overcome um, with that provider. But if you try that and that doesn't work, um, then I would say, well, maybe we should seek out other resources if you aren't getting your answers um, uh, from that provider. I would agree. I'm actually of the belief that if you have a provider who um, is offended, if you're interested in a second opinion, then that is evidence to me that I need a second opinion. I'm a little bit... Maybe a different provider. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So uh, this is your life you're talking about, Mm -hmm. and heart failure is a serious chronic illness that is often terminal. So I think it's warrants a second opinion. Yeah. So, and, and I think that here, here's a perspective because this is some of the data that we know uh, for women with heart disease. So women with heart disease, um, first of all, they are less likely to even be cared for by a cardiologist. Mm-hmm. And even if they have a cardiologist, they may be less likely to than men to be referred for advanced heart failure treatments like left ventricular assist mm-hmm. devices or ICDs and other. So, It may be that a woman needs to ask, and it's not to change to a different doctor, it may be that it is, I need a a second opinion to make sure I do or don't need that higher level of care. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, again, I'm I'm a huge, for cancer, for heart disease, for those things, second opinions, they either affirm your doctor's doing a great job Mm -hmm. or they have a nuance and give you more options. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, the, the second part of that question was how in the same practice, and that can be, um, if those two doctors, two cardiologists, have different expert specialty expertise, as is the practice that you know the practices that we have, there may actually be a role for not necessarily changing doctors. I'm I might send them yeah. to another colleague mm-hmm. to give some insight. Mm-hmm. So in that case, but if you're just asking to change from one doctor to another in a small practice, that sometimes can um, ruffle feathers because all people have egos. So I, I think it, that part, it sort of depends. Any okay. other perspectives on that? I'll um, tell you, as a nurse, the nurses often You all hear this. about it. <laughs> um, uh, as a nurse or a nurse practitioner, we often field this question of, 
I'm, I'm not comfortable with so-and-so anymore, or I've heard great things about so-and-so, what do you think about switching? And um, uh, generally in our practice, it's, it's, we just make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and we try to do, make it happen as gracefully as possible. Um, Cause at the end of the day, we're all here to help patients. Right. I had kind of an experience like that too. Um, the cardiac center in San Diego, I first had a doctor that dealt with, he said he was an electrician and dealt with, with the heart failure with a pacemaker and all that, but that wasn't working. And he said, I'm going to go ahead and refer you over to the plumber, which is the doctor that dealt with heart failure, which, you know, honestly, I mean, just even the electrician and plumber terminology helped me. And I'm thinking, you know, he knew that he couldn't go forward more or more with what he, his expertise was in. Yeah. So he gave it to his colleague. Yeah, yeah. I think, so yeah. I can't skip this opportunity to talk about the, the role of advanced heart failure. Uh, so as we're talking about, there's kind of subspecialties. So you would think cardiology is a specialty enough of itself, but um, cardiologists can actually further specialize and spend many, many more years and further, further, further specialize <laughs> in other disciplines. And that speaks to what you're talking about with electricians and plumbers. And we kind of um, sometimes use those sort of contractor terminology to describe what we specialize in. Heart failure, there's actually a specialty in advanced heart failure. And that's for um, those of us that practice in often in large academic medical centers where we do heart failure transplants and mechanical circulatory support or LVADs. And what we would recommend, uh, you need a referral to an advanced heart failure center when you're having repeated heart failure hospitalizations, when you're clearly deteriorating uh, despite being on the right medications, um, when you're just not thriving um, despite doing your best, that's when it's time to consider at least an evaluation by a heart failure uh, provider, um, and certainly if you're having those heart failure hospitalizations. All right, we've got another question. I, I suspect I might have side effects from my medications, and most people with heart failure have, are on lots of medications. I'm tempted to stop them to see if I feel better. Maybe just try vitamins and supplements. Is that safe? Um, okay, Tasha, you can start with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you probably could tell by the look on my face. <laughs> uh, no poker face. No. Yeah, I don't have a very good poker face. Um, it, no. Uh, it wouldn't be safe. Um, and our first recommendation, our first recommendation right off the bat would be if this needs to be communicated with your team. Um, any changes to your medication should be communicated with your team, whether it's starting or stopping a medication. Um, work together with your team and um, communicate all of that, whether you're interested in a, a new supplement, a new vitamin, um, and frankly, even if it's a, an illegal substance, it should be reviewed with your medical team. We're not here to judge you, we're here to help you. Um, that being said, um, there isn't evidence to support, um, it's not that we're opposed to those um, over-the-counter vitamins, supplements, etc. It's just that we don't have the evidence to support their use. Um, in contrast, we do have evidence to support, particularly in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or weak hearts, we do have evidence to support the use of the medications that we, we the prescription medications that we use. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Virgin. Yeah, and I, would, I totally agree with everything you said, but I also wanted to emphasize that, you know, if you're having side effects from medications, it's really important, as you said, to communicate this with your provider as we can also adjust those medications. We can also find alternatives to the medications. And also, this could be a signal for something that's totally unrelated to the medications. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to communicate that. And I think sometimes patients think, because they've told me, they've said, well, you gave me that medication. It didn't work or I had a side effect, so I just stopped it. And I'm bringing them back in three months to check on how that medication has worked for them, Mm -hmm. and they're not taking it. So that's a waste of time for both of Mm us. And if they'd only picked up the phone or gone through the portal and said, Mm -hmm. it's not working for me, usually we have like three or four others that are alternatives that would have been easy. So I think communicating that communication is so important, yeah. right? Yeah, and definitely um, a lot of patients, I know I've even done this too, suffered through some symptoms waiting for my next appointment. Mm-hmm. And no, yeah, all you need to do is call. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've I've been feeling I've had this rash for three yes. weeks, and I, yes. but I knew yes. I had this appointment, so I thought I'd have I, no. Yes, <laughs> I would have liked to hear about it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, 
So here's a question from uh, Don. Um, does uh, it's about a specific device, but it's a bigger question. So it's uh, does a group have feelings about a, a cardiac MEMS device? My cardiologist is recommending it to monitoring and keeping me out of the hospital, and it's in a clinical trial. And rather than answering about this specific device, um, I'd like for all of us to talk about. Um, clinical trials, women, heart failure. I'm not big on feeling like a guinea pig for a trial. Tasha, do you want to talk about, I, I like both of the physicians, but also uh, sure. you. Um, so I think, you know, historically women have been underrepresented in clinical research, which is in the end a detriment to all of us. Um, it, it's it's put us in this position now where we're, we're kind of hypothesizing about um, the symptoms of how do women present with heart failure and how are we different and how do we respond to treatment and I think if more women participated in research we would have more answers and we would be in a better position today so I say that um, first off okay. second off um, the implantable remote monitoring is um, far more successful than non-implantable remote monitoring in heart failure. We talked earlier about weight monitoring for heart failure, and we know that statistically it really doesn't do any good alone. Okay. Um, when it's paired with a comprehensive disease management program and day-to-day -day management by a nurse, it does okay. But implantable cardiac monitoring, such as the device she's mentioned here, um, per the CHAMPION trial and a couple of uh, trials since then have shown that it does help keep, keep people out of the hospital. And there is currently a trial going on now to expand um, the coverage or the indication for mm -hmm. implant. So I think there's promising evidence and um, we'll see where it goes from here. Yeah. So in general, um, Dr. Brewer, what are you, I mean, I know you're a big advocate of participating in research, but why is it particularly important for women and people of color and minority communities? Yeah, so it's extremely important for women and uh, racial ethnic minorities to enroll in clinical trials so that we can know if these interventions and medications actually work in us and for us. Um, if we're not at the table, then we're kind of just blindly giving out these medications and interventions without knowing if they truly work in these special populations. So I'm a strong advocate, as you know, um, for increasing representation of these groups in clinical trials, and it's a way for us to be at the table. I actually had the CardioMIMS device, mm -hmm. and um, I was one of the first patients in California to try it, and it was that was 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, from what I've understood, though, is that it's gone to uh, St. Jude's Hospital or to their research department now, and, mm -hmm. and they're possibly using it on children. But it definitely helped me because I live so far away from a hospital mm -hmm. that, and also we don't have um, really good internet service where I'm from. So, I mean, that's also like other rural communities, but you're actually able to plug it into a phone line. And those pressure readings I would do every night. My son actually would press a little button for me, and he was very interactive with it. And that really, that saved me a lot of hospital visits. It also saved me when the doctor called and said, you need to get in now. Yeah, so it was a proactive response. Very, yeah, I recommend it. Yeah, so yeah. I think beyond that, I, I, that we know from people who participate in mm -hmm. clinical trials um, or just research, there are other things that come along with it, often more visits to the doctor that are covered by the research, testing, and other things. So on average, people who have the same disease processes, who participate in research, actually have better outcomes. And it's, it, it, it isn't because, so I think reframing the guinea pig, because nobody wants mm -hmm. to be a guinea pig, yes. is how I can be a contributor, because yes, clearly yes. you were, um, by, mm -hmm. by doing this, uh, both to yourself and to, and to others. Um, Thanks for sharing that as well, um, because it, it truly shows how interventions can be tailored to meet your needs. As yes. you mentioned, um, kind of your location and just kind of the um, convenience of that helped yes. you. So that helps us to develop better interventions for our patients. So thank you. So uh, we've got a question um, uh, that isn't directly heart failure related, but um, it is from a SCAD heart attack survivor. And for those in the audience who don't know, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, so it's a type of heart attack where the artery splits can lead, and if you have a big heart attack to heart failure, how do I convince conventional cardiologists that I'm not considered a patient with coronary artery disease, never had heart issues, blood pressure normal, and normal cholesterol? So I think that's, you know, it, it, there's actually a corollary with heart failure because you could be feel completely normal 
and have reduced heart pumping function. Mm -hmm. And so there's the different views. I think just maybe some definitions, because um, one of the things I do in my practice is, is um, uh, take care of patients and research spontaneous coronary artery dissection. It isn't so much coronary artery disease, but it is heart disease. Mm -hmm. um, most people who've had a SCAD have had heart damage. And so it is heart disease writ large, but we don't treat it the same way as we treat a heart attack caused by plaque rupture. It's kind of the, uh, the, analogous, the analogy in heart failure, we don't treat heart failure with reduced heart pumping function the exact same way as we do with preserved uh, heart pumping function. The more I think that we can customize the care for all of these conditions, and particularly among women, the, the better. And, and I'm not asking you to talk about, uh, about SCAD, but maybe the importance of customizing treatment to the actual cause. Your practice is mainly reduced heart pumping function, um, or do you care? Do you care for a lot of HFPF? Uh, yeah, actually, so HFPF uh, or the preserved ejection fraction is, uh, you know, in the general population is fifty to sixty percent of heart failure nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, and probably was all along. We just didn't we just recognize didn't it because <laughs> it was uh, in women. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I do. We care for um, like fifty percent of my patients are more than likely. Uh, um, have peppers. It's probably a little less because I'm in an advanced heart failure center, so we tend to do reduced ejection fraction more because we're working towards transplant and mechanical circulatory support. That being said, the challenge with HEFPEF is that, as you mentioned in the introduction, we don't have any evidence-based or guideline-based mm -hmm. medications to give for HEFPEF. So we have to target the risk factors for HEFPEF, and one of those risk factors is gender or sex, and we can't change that. Mm -hmm. So we can change hypertension, we can control the heart rhythm, we can um, work on body weight or maintaining a healthy body weight, we can work on sleep apnea. So we try to target all of those things um, and man manage the fluid. Right. Um, in contrast with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we have a, a robust guidelines that have been in, you know, in place for many years and we adjust them every couple of years. And in just in the past couple of years, we've had the addition of a couple of new medications that we're excited about and uh, we're slowly catching on um, to implementing those new medications. So I just want to say there's a couple of comments saying how great, from your champion colleagues, saying how great you're doing. Oh. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> nice. They're coming you. up on the feed, Aww. so I think that's great. <laughs> Um, so uh, from uh, Joanne, when will I know that I'm healthy enough to resume romance and intimacy with my spouse? Okay, I'm going to start with you, Tasha. <laughs> so that's an interesting question. Um, honestly, there aren't a lot of limitations about mm -hmm. resuming romance uh, with heart failure. As long as not you're not having active chest pain and you've been clear, if you don't have coronary artery disease, if you have been cleared by your cardiologist, um, if you do have coronary artery disease, there aren't limitations from a heart failure perspective. We do have recommendations that are a little more sensitive in that um, we recommend, um, to be frank, positions that are um, comfortable. And, and more energy saving, yeah. perhaps. Right. Yeah. So if you are short of breath and can't uh, maintain that position, then you need to adjust. Right. Other thoughts? So, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to applaud uh, that person for even bringing that question up because sometimes that is taboo to talk mm -hmm. about our sexual health. Um, so it's really important because if that's not addressed, then that can then lead to um, depression and um, other mental health challenges. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, I think we're talking about thriving, right? We want to get back to what whatever is important to us. And for most people, having intimacy with somebody um, is important, right? So um, if someone is doing, another question, if somebody is doing everything their doctor tells them, but isn't feeling any, they're getting any better, what should they do? Let's start with you, Brandy, as a patient. So this has probably happened to you before. What did you do that you would recommend somebody else to do and maybe you did something you would not recommend? <laughs> uh, well, definitely the communication with your doctors is, is very, very important. And to bring up if there's any um, any uh, additional symptoms that you've all of a sudden like, you know, noticed or, or any more of the, uh, any kind of um, 
medication issues, that type of stuff, but definitely you need to communicate with your doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Tasha, what about you? I think we've touched on some of it, you know, um, be persistent. And, and, mm-hmm. and like Brandy just said, you know, bring up the symptoms that they're not asking. Yes. Uh, tell us how your life is changing, because yes. maybe we're not asking the right questions. Um, and then, as mentioned earlier, if you're, if you're continuing to fail and you're not getting a response, consider a second opinion. So, Tasha, can you talk a little bit about, because you work right in this space, some of the advanced heart failure treatments that somebody, who maybe they are on a really good medical program, um, and they're following, and they have a good relationship with their doc, but that next level of care, we've mm-hmm. talked about the implantable devices. Um, people may not know exactly what uh, left and right ventricular assist devices. I'd love for you to just share a little bit more so people know what other options there might be. Sure, so for patients who have reduced heart function or what was formerly known as systolic heart failure or a weak heart function where their ejection fraction is reduced, um, as the heart failure gets worse, they may become eligible for a heart transplant or a mechanical circulatory support, um, which is most commonly a left ventricular assist device, which is in layman's terms, we're, we're in the Midwest here, so we have a lot of farmers, so I often describe it, and I think the uh, companies might die if they hear this, but <laughs> I often describe it as a sump pump for your heart. So it's a mechanical pump that we insert in the left ventricle of the heart, um, and it helps pump the blood from the left ventricle forward through the aorta. So it kind of takes over some of the work of the left ventricle. So like a sump pump draining the the overflow from your basement, this kind of helps drain the overflow from your heart and alleviate some work from your heart. Uh, It keeps things moving forward, Um, and um, it can be implanted as bridge to transplant, so to help keep you alive and functioning well until you're able to receive a heart transplant, or as destination therapy for patients who are not transplant candidates. So in those cases, um, the pump is implanted and and it stays with you until you pass. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are, and then there's pacemakers that can help um, sort of make the heart contract more um, efficiently? Yep, so biventricular pacing um, can help in in heart failure, especially again with the reduced ejection fraction, the heart can kind of go from what typically looks like a a football shape at the bottom to kind of a a flat basketball that needs to be filled with air. And and when it has that boggy shape, the, the two sides don't work together. So a normal heart would kind of pump together. It's synchronized. But when it gets all boggy like this, it kind of it's not working together. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, um, and there's certain criteria that has to be met, but we can place in a lead, an electrical lead here and an electrical lead here, and we can tell the heart to beat and synchronize the left and right side of the heart, and that's called biventricular pacing. Or resynchronization therapy. Yeah, and, exactly. And I, and I think that um, it has been shown that women who are appropriate candidates do as well or even better with this therapy than, uh, than men who receive it. That's right. Um, I actually had a pacemaker did and, and defibrillator uh, combo, and um, when, it, when I first had it implanted, it definitely um, gave me a lot more energy. Um, but it didn't work for me after a while. Um, but I did have the defibrillator part of it actually go off twice, and it did save my life. So um, I know it's scary to think about a pacemaker, but um, you know when you when the doctors explain like this really can help your quality of life, mm-hmm. I definitely recommend recommend people doing it. Yeah. So I, I think that the the point of this is there are other options, and if your symptoms are not improving. Um, and there's lots of clinical trials, there's a lot of interest, so to not only to treat the heart failure, to, but really push the thriving part of this, because um, the pacemaker, you said, you know, it did help you feel better for a while, yes, because it get, you know, it, it, sometimes some people's heart failure continues to progress as yours did, or not, not get better, but I think this, it's the importance of having communication with the healthcare team. Um, one of the commenters just uh, said the doctor-nurse-patient relationship is so important, and I think one of the things we know about heart failure, it is a team sport mm-hmm. um, to, in terms of caring for it. So um, who are the members of the team that you rely upon, uh, with the patient being in the center, mm-hmm. as the main player, the <laughs> <Absolutely>. MVP? <laughs> Absolutely. I think it, it varies depending on on your center. Um, um, most uh, large heart failure centers or large academic heart failure centers 
tend to have an advanced heart failure physician leading the team. Um, they often have heart failure advanced practice providers such mm-hmm. as myself, um, heart failure nurses, ideally heart failure certified nurses. Um, some have uh, medical assistants or LPNs who often uh, assist with you know, documentation, uh, rooming, things like that. Um, but really the backbone of most heart failure clinics is the nursing. Yeah. They kind of are the front lines they are the people you speak to on a day-to-day basis, and they are the people, they're the eyes and the ears of the rest of the team. Yep. And since it is a disproportionately female um, uh, profession, um, not completely, but it is something I think for women um, often feel like talking to another woman, they feel like there's a certain amount that they'll get. Yep. So uh, a question I, I, I'd like to just how you handle and maybe how you received, um, if somebody, who has heart failure is clearly not thriving. And you've done all of the things that, you know, checking is the medication working, everything, and it does appear that this is an individual whose depression has progressed perhaps or developed. Um, how do you broach that? And, uh, you know, do you have somebody embedded in your practice? How do you personally handle that conversation um, with somebody? Because uh, we talked earlier about stigma, but how do we get people to act? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we, there are a couple of screening tools that uh, some clinics hand out right when you come into the clinic and you fill them out on an iPad, and um, they they are useful tools, but I find them, you know, they're useful. They have their value. Mm-hmm. But I think the conversation is so much more valuable when, it, when you can see somebody eye to eye and you can feel their mood and you can feel what's going on. Um, uh, we're in my clinic. We're lucky. We have a behavioral, um, behavioral spiritual team in the building that is on call in the clinic, um, and their entire role is to help bridge people until they're able to establish with a psychologist team, um, because all too often mental health teams are unavailable or have a long wait list, or your insurance doesn't cover it, or, or there's a long list of reasons why we can't get people in. Um, so in the meantime, we have a behavioral health um, specialist who can literally come to clinic. I can page him, and he can come to clinic, introduce himself to patients, and say, hey, my name is Steve. What's going on? I understand you have a new diagnosis of heart failure. Um, can we talk about it? And, and if he's unavailable that day for whatever reason or the patient can't wait around, uh, we get the patient's permission, and he will call them and set up a time. And he assures that nobody kind of falls through the cracks mm-hmm. until they get in to see somebody six weeks later. Um, uh, it's a really remarkable program, and, uh, and, and Steve is literally his name, uh, <laughs> and, and he's wonderful. I had that also. Um, well, actually, I even recommend it for other hospitals to do is after the transplant, it's such an ordeal. And when you finally are moved out of the intensive care unit, you go into like the cardiac ward. And um, I was about maybe two weeks out from my transplant. I was still in the hospital. They brought in a therapist to talk to me. Mm-hmm. And at first I was, mm-hmm. you know, just clearly upset. I was on a lot of steroids and your emotions are up and down, up and down. <laughs> but it did help to talk to someone. Mm-hmm. And and um, I hope other hospitals actually do that and bring more behavioral health team members in. Yeah. Yeah. And so you you recognized that you were having emotional roller coaster. And you can control it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, was there ever a time where you didn't recognize that you, that it was depression rather than heart failure or a combination that you had to be convinced, or did you know? Well, I just knew. Like I, I would be very happy at one point and watching Deadliest Catch, like the nurse is like, don't bother Brandy when she's watching Deadliest Catch. It's a, <laughs> it's a fishing show. <laughs> but, um, but then I would be very sad and I would cry and I couldn't stop crying. And so, but you know, talking to the therapist and the nurses were amazing. I, I applaud all nurses everywhere uh, would come in and talk to me and say that this is okay, go ahead and cry. You know, it's a lot of it's your medication and a lot of it is what you've been through. So. How do you have that conversation? Yeah, I really love um, that both examples that you all have described really is normalizing this um that it it, it's okay to say i need help or you know just to tell someone what's going on um and that way we can offer you the best resources to help you get through this whether that's a therapist um whether that's a social support group um or just tinkering with your your medications as well so i'm I'm really pleased that um we're we're normalizing this and that this is a conversation that we need to have in all heart failure patients Mm -hmm. In different, cul- all different cultures. All patients. Yes. Living. <laughs> in different cultures, too. You know, we have um, special songs in, in our language and in our community, and I'm sure other 
other um, ethnic backgrounds have the mm -hmm. same thing too, but be able to listen to, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that definitely helps. I think that's going to be our last question for um, today for this, and I really appreciate the folks that have been peppering us with questions and comments and likes and a few sads and mads, because I think um, some of this is not, not about us. Oh. I don't think I have to assume it's about the topic because, you know, a heart failure is one of those things that nobody wants to hear as a diagnosis, but that's why this panel was put together to talk about how we will thrive with heart failure and that patients can and do as Brandy did. So this concludes our discussion today, seven strategies for thriving with heart failure. I'd like to thank our viewers, our panelists, and sponsors for their support of this series. I would also like to thank Women Heart and the American Association for Heart Failure Nurses for their leadership in highlighting challenges for women through diagnosis, treatment, and thriving with heart failure. Remember to consult your personal healthcare team with any questions or before modifying any care strategies. Please visit womenheart.org for more information or to learn more about connecting with women with heart disease. Thank you very much.